Hello and welcome everybody and oh my apologies because I've got a chat window up on my screen. Hi, so welcome everybody. I think um, it's about time for us to kick off now. So my name is Dr. Paul Hellier. I'm an associate professor here at UCL Mechanical Engineering and it is my pleasure to be sharing with you today some of our work designing clean, efficient future fuels. And so this is part of Spring into STEM from the UCL Faculty of Engineering. So I think we're gonna, we're gonna kick off right about now. And so just a little bit of housekeeping. What, how this is gonna work for the next hour is I'm gonna be sharing some of our work in the form of a lecture. And then afterwards, there'll be about half an hour for any questions that you might wish to ask. And because we're also intending to upload this lecture onto YouTube for people to look at later, Hi, if you're watching later on YouTube. Because of that, we are going to keep the cameras and the mics off for everybody. So, and yeah, as I said, any questions that you might have, please, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll get onto them after the lecture. And also, if there are any kinds of technical faults, if I disappear, if you can't hear me, if my screen is it's not my slides, please, please do let us know as well in the Q&A box. Great, so that's the housekeeping done with. And thank you all again for joining us today. I'm going to kick straight off and tell you a little bit about why I'm here. So I'm gonna share with you, as I said, some of our work developing these clean burning, low emission fuels. But before I get into that, I thought I would explain a little bit about why I'm here or how did I get here as I put perhaps a little bit more nicely on the slide. So. I did not start out my academic career here at UCL as a mechanical engineer. I, in fact, started out my academic career in Cardiff University in Wales, where I studied environmental engineering. And that is me, believe it or not. That picture on the bottom left hand now of the slide, the boss, that is me striding purposefully across the field, being followed by a herd of sheep. But this was being done, I can assure you, for a very good engineering reason. So I studied environmental engineering as my undergraduate degree. And in addition to the close proximity to sheep, which I obviously enjoyed, I really enjoyed the degree because it was all about thinking, how can we join up different problems, different aspects of, of engineering, we did modules in mechanical engineering, we did some civil engineering, we did dedicated environmental engineering, and all of the time we were thinking about what is the impact of this process, of this engineering process, of this way that we are designing, that we're using energy, that we're building, and thinking about how can we as engineers try to mitigate negative impacts, and how can we join up problems? If there's a waste stream, how can we get some benefit from that. How can we turn a problem like waste into something useful, for example, like a fuel? And that really stayed with me. And that's that kind of informed what I've been doing subsequently. But I really enjoyed that time there. We did things like environmental impact assessments, thinking about the impact for uh, uh, you know, new developments of, of using, changing the way that what land is used. And that's why I'm striding purposely across that field. We've just been counting sheep to understand the impact of, uh, of actually opening a gold mine in Wales on them. But anyway, after my environmental engineering degree, I came here to UCL and I started a PhD. I started a PhD in, in, um, in, in, in biofuels, in the kinds of things that I've been doing subsequently. And it was very different in many respects, because what I did now is I spent a lot of time in the labs. I spent a lot of times working on a research engine that you can see a picture of in the top right hand corner there of the current slides and thinking about how when we make very small changes, very specific changes to a fuel composition, and I'm going to explain all of this in much more detail in a minute, but thinking about how we make changes to a fuel when we change the design of a fuel with a view to changing where that fuel comes from, of course, what does that do to the way that it releases energy? What does that do to the way that it burns and the way that emissions form subsequently? And so I spent about four, four and a half years on my PhD, which was, as I said, a very different kind of environment to my first degree. Uh, two floors underground, 
for most of my time. No natural sunlight, but that was okay. I really, really enjoyed what I was doing. And I was working with an industrial partner during the course of that PhD, but at the same time, being here at UCL, having exposure to so many other disciplines, other engineering, other scientific disciplines, as I got into other potential types of renewable fuels as well. And again, I'm gonna come back to this in a bit, but I did things, for example, like meeting biologists who could structurally engineer microalgae to produce different types of fuels. And I kind of, you know, I developed all these kind of side parts, these other focuses as part of my PhD towards different routes of sustainable fuels. And I liked it. And I was, I was fortunate enough to have opportunities to stay here in various forms. I was able to, uh, to receive funding from, from the EPSRC, which is the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council. I was given a fellowship to carry on and stay here at UCL and, and continue in my research career. And so that's me now in the bottom right hand corner of the slide as well with one of my PhD students, Tim. And that's, you know, I don't get to put the red overalls on as much as I like nowadays, but this is, this is part of what we do still, working with PhD students, working with colleagues towards continuing our research. So that's enough about me, I think. But what I would normally do now, if, uh, if I would given this particular talk, this presentation, maybe five or six years ago now, is I would dive straight into now the motivation behind the research of renewable fuels, the development of sustainable fuels. But while I was putting together this presentation, I reflected a little bit on the fact that actually I've changed, as illustrated by the two photos on this particular slide, I've changed over the course of my career as an engineer, and so is the world and the context in which we're trying to solve these problems. That's changed as well. And so whereas five or six years ago, I might have had to start my presentation by explaining the urgent need to decarbonize, to move towards sustainable fuels. I, I was kind of hoping that today, actually, I don't need to explicitly have that on the slide because what's changed over the past five or six years is that policy and, and I think communities all around the world now really do recognize the need to move away from fossil fuel usage towards sustainable alternatives. And at the same time, what's become really, really apparent as well is, is the need to do that in a holistic manner. And that's what I was trying to get at when I was telling you about my undergraduate degree, the, the kind of engineering approach where we take a holistic viewpoint, where we, we try and tie together different problems. And, you know, when we do environmental impact assessments, that kind of thing, where we, we try to think about all of the issues that might arise from a particular engineering solution. And like a really glaring problem with the way that we've been using energy in the form of combustion has been as well as obviously the impact on greenhouse gas emissions the effects of global warming the other really glaring problem that we've been having is the impact on health the impact on air quality for the emission of other pollutants pollutants that aren't particularly to do with whether or not a fuel is a fossil fuel but pollutants that just arise anyway because of the very high temperature nature of combustion and releasing energy in that manner. So things like particulate matter, things like nitrogen oxides, NOx, which have very terrible impacts on our local environment and on human health. So I'm not gonna start with a slide describing that motivation because like I said, I, I think it's actually, it's, it's obviously that we still have those challenges to meet, but actually I was reflecting and I was thinking, hopefully the world has changed enough that it's, it's kind of obvious that we need to tackle those things. And I really hope that is the case. So we need to just move away to renewable fuels. Sorry, I'm just changing slides. Yes, good. And so when I say fuels, fuels, I'm gonna talk mostly today about liquid fuels. So diesel, gasoline type fuels, fuels that you've probably interacted with for most of your lives, you know? Maybe you drive or maybe you don't, but you'll have definitely you'll have been on a bus or a plane or a train that makes use of these liquid fuels. And when we talk about fuels, especially in a liquid form, there are many different ways that we can classify them. And there are de many different properties that we can use to describe them. We could use physical properties. We can discuss things like their boiling point, their melting point, things like viscosity. We can talk about their chemical properties or their, their properties with respect to their application. So when you go along to say a petrol station and you fill up a car with petrol or gasoline, 
often you'll have a choice. There'll be different grades of petrol that you can use. They'll, and they'll have a different octane rating. And we'll talk about that again in a minute. But the octane rating is just an indication of that particular grade of fuel having a slightly different set of properties relative to its application. It means it will work in a very slightly different way, depending on which grade you go for. But, but the, way, the way that I see these fuels is I, I try not to think about these physical properties and these kind of application specific properties. Instead, in our research, what we tend to do is we tend to think about the molecular structure of the compounds that make up these different fuels. So when somebody says to you diesel or gasoline, there is no single chemical compound which is diesel, or there is no single chemical compound which is gasoline. Both of those fuels, because of the nature of where they come from, the fact that they are dug up as crude oil and then they're fractionated and distilled, separated according to things like their boiling points, means that those fuels are in fact mixtures, mixtures of many, many, I'm gonna say hundreds, I think hundreds, yeah, hundreds of different compounds, different compounds, different chemical species with different molecular structures. And they're grouped together just because they happen to all work together well in a certain way. And those fuels can be very different when you start looking at them in terms of their chemical, the molecular structure. So I've got some examples of this on the current slide. So in the top left-hand corner, some of those current hydrocarbon type fuels, they tend to have long straight chains sometimes. Where there are two lines together, that indicates a double bond, which I'll talk about again in a minute. Or they can be in ring type structures and they can have branches coming off. And they, and in the diesel and in the gasoline that we use, we find many, many different permutations and many different proportional mixtures of these kinds of molecules. And then when we start thinking about biofuels, they, they're the same. There's, you know, something like biodiesel, for example, isn't a single distinct compound, a single distinct chemical. It's many, many different chemicals which are related to one another and have some commonality and have some key differences relative to the diesel fuels, or sorry, to the, to the fossil fuels, but they're not a single compound. But the way that biofuels, despite this kind of variation within that group of fuels, the way that they tend to differ from those fossil fuels is that because of where they come from, because they come from organic matter, they're going to contain oxygen to some extent, to some level, and they're gonna have a lot more scope, therefore, for utilizing the fact that there's oxygen within the molecule and the fact that we can choose different sources for our renewable fuels, different types of biomass, different waste streams, different ways of modifying those initial chemicals and molecules that come from a renewable feedstock. And if we have all of those decisions that we can make, then as engineers, what we can do, what's really exciting is that when we're trying now, we need to replace, displace current fossil fuels is we don't have to settle for simply producing equivalent fuels. In fact, as engineers, what's exciting is trying to make better fuels. So that's what I'm gonna talk about now. I'm gonna give some examples of how we try and engineer, how we try and understand the kinds of changes, the kinds of features that we should include in a fuel to make it better. So, so this I'm gonna dive straight in now and share with you therefore some experimental results. So this plot now on the screen, this shows a whole range of different potential fuel molecules that have been tested in a diesel engine in our labs downstairs from where I am now. And they vary in very, very small ways. There's only a very small difference between the different fuel molecules described along the x-axis. And if any of you out there are chemists, then you'll probably recognize what the difference is. What we've done here is we've taken eight carbon atoms in a row, and we have taken away two hydrogen atoms. There would normally be a full complement. If you have eight carbon atoms, you would expect if the molecule was fully saturated, you would expect there for, to be 18 hydrogen atoms. But we're looking at the alkene, which means that there's a single double bond between two carbon atoms because two of those hydrogens have been removed. And what we're looking at in this plot and what we looked at in this study was what was the effect of having this relatively minor feature of molecular structure and keeping everything else constant, what was the effect of moving the position within that chain of carbon atoms 
what was the effect of moving the position of that carbon to carbon double bond? And we looked at this in terms of what is shown on the y-axis on this plot. What is the effect on the duration of ignition delay? Now, I'll come to what ignition delay is in a second, but whenever we want to release energy from a liquid fuel via a combustion process, and there are gonna be times still moving ahead as we make better use of electrification, there are still gonna be times because of the energy density, because of the, the rapidity with which we can release energy during combustion, there are gonna be lots of times still where we want to use a liquid fuel and we want to release energy during combustion. But to make that useful, to make that an efficient release of energy, to make it a clean release of energy in terms of preventing the formation of emissions that are detrimental to health, what's really important is that we can control two things. We can control when does the fuel start burning, and that's ignition, and we can control how quickly does the fuel start burning. And we'll look at that again in a little bit in the context of some of those air quality relevant emissions. But here then, on the y-axis of this plot, we're looking at ignition delay. And in a diesel engine or a compression ignition engine, the ignition delay is the time that it takes in between introducing a fuel into what's a very high temperature, very high pressure environment, and then the time at which the fuel ignites, it starts burning. And the thing that I, I like, that I find exciting about a diesel engine or a compression ignition engine, is that we don't do anything in order to initiate that start to combustion. We rely entirely on the fuel composition, on the fuel chemistry to decide when does the fuel start burning. And so there's lots of scope then for changing the fuel composition to influence that start of ignition. And that's what we saw here. So we have along the bottom on the x-axis, we are moving the position of that single double bond towards the center of our octene molecule eight carbon atoms in a row. And on the y-axis then, we have increasing duration of ignition delay. And what you can see is that making that very small change, just moving the position of the carbon to carbon double bond into the center of the molecule results in this increase in the duration of ignition delay. And it can be useful. I mean, it can be desirable, or maybe sometimes it's not desirable and you'd rather have the shorter duration of ignition delay. But what's significant is that such a small change is having such a big impact. And highlighted on the right side of the plot of the web, ah, on the right hand side of the plot of, as well, is what happens when we just change the bond angle. We go from the trans free octane there to the cis free octane, and nothing has changed. The position of the bond is the same, but the angle of that bond has changed. And even that provokes, you can see highlighted on the results figure, quite a significant change in the duration of ignition delay. So, how do we do these kinds of experiments? So this is this schematic now is 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 kind of um, it's it's really how did we force the engine our test engine our research equipment to test these fuels which as you'll see in a minute get further and further away from being what are actually used today as real fuels how did we force the engine to accept these fuels which normally if you were to put into a car or a truck would probably break the fuels. But what we had to do, what's really important, especially for these diesel engine tests, is that we inject the fuels at really high pressures, at least say six, 700 bar, so 600, uh, 600 times atmospheric pressure, all the way up to several thousand bar in very modern engines. And so we came up with a system as shown here, whereby we use the conventional fuel circuit shown in red as a means of pressurizing our prototype fuels which could therefore be very small in quantity, which was important because some of them had to be synthesized and were quite expensive or difficult to make. And we could then use a pressure cylinder with free moving pistons inside to transfer these very high injection pressures from the red hand side to the green side where we have our test fuel, our prototype fuel of interest. And it meant that we could get away with having fuels which were very high melting point, were perhaps a little bit acidic or corrosive, had poor lubricity, and we could still though get them into the engine at the right kinds of conditions to be able to observe these impacts of things like fuel molecular structure. And this is that same system now set up in the lab. And um, this is something I did during my PhD. And so I'm very proud of all the orange colored space age tape. But you can see now, what we did is we took a relatively conventional engine, 
And we had this system set up so that we could, we could deliver these very small novel amounts of fuel into the combustion chamber, but then still get all the same information. You'll see in a minute that what we do is we measure the pressure inside the engine combustion chamber in real time so that we can derive things like the ignition delay we were just talking about. And we also always look in the exhaust as well. And we use special analyzers to check the exhaust gas composition and see how the change in fuel structure impacts things like NOx and particulates. So, so moving on. So how do we start to apply this kind of knowledge of how these very small changes of fuel molecular structure can impact the combustion behavior? Well, I mentioned at the beginning when I was kind of telling you about me a little bit, one of the, the things I got into during my PhD was this idea that microalgae could be genetically modified to produce different designer fuels. And that's, that's really exciting because I don't know how much you know about algae, but I really like algae because algae, algae is a plant and therefore it photosynthesizes, it produces its energy and it produces the kinds of materials that it uses to store its energy purely from sunlight and from carbon dioxide. And it's quite tolerant. You can grow on wastewater, you can grow on waste carbon dioxide. And what it does to store energy when it's growing in this way is that it grows fat by storing lipids or fats, oils. And so I met during my PhD some structural and molecular biologists who came to us and said, we've got an idea. We've got this particular strain of microalgae that we can modify and introduce particular pathways, metabolic pathways, in order for it to produce a particular compound. And this compound is the one circled in green on the figure, something called geraniol. And we think that this could be a good diesel fuel because it's quite heavy and it's, it seems to have the right kind of physical properties. And we were able to look at that molecular structure, the one I'm showing there in, in green and say, well, maybe it will, or maybe it won't be so good because it contains things like the double bonds and the branching and the alcohol group at the end. What else can you make? Or how could we change this to potentially improve this? So we did a whole big study where we took this kind of roadmap of the different possible molecules that could be made from this genetically engineered microalgae and looked at what happened when we did in practice and make those very small changes to the fuel molecular structure and to find out which ones are beneficial. Because if there's gonna be an investment in time and energy of making these fuels or engineering the algae, for example, then it's good to direct that towards something that's gonna be as good as it can be. And this is what we saw. So apologies, there's a lot of chemistry, but I'll go through this quite quickly. On the left-hand side of this plot, which again shows ignition delay on the y-axis, on the left-hand side of the plot is a molecule that we started with there, the geraniol. And then what I want to draw your attention to is about halfway through this plot, there is another molecule called geranial. And I'm showing these as well on the right-hand side of the plot there. And this saw, when we went from geraniol to geranial, which is just taking away one hydrogen atom, this had of all the different changes we tried, all the different permutations of molecular structure. And this example, this had the biggest impact on that duration of ignition delay. And so potentially on the combustion process. And that was a single hydrogen atom, only one hydrogen atom that was removed in order to achieve that effect. So, sorry, I'm going through this quite quickly now because I realized I've got way more than I wanted to tell you than I probably have time for. But just to, to kind of highlight a few other things. One of the other things that we've been doing a lot of work on is thinking about fuels that can come from waste biomass. So woody materials, things that don't compete with the production of crops for food. Or if they do come from crops, they are the waste materials. They are the parts of the plant that don't get utilized towards food production. Because what's become ever so important recently is the realization that when we talk about sustainable fuels or just generally sustainable energy, we need to think about the whole life cycle. It's not just that at the point of use at which we have to look at the impact on greenhouse gas emissions and, and air quality. So what we do is we look at the kinds of molecules that can be readily produced from things like biomass. And what this figure is showing is the kind of the map, the routes via which these different molecules can be produced. And, at, and with the points I want to make is that every time you see an arrow in this figure, every time there's one of those black arrows going from one fuel structure 
to another fuel structure. What they represent is another processing stuff, another investment in energy, another cost in terms of life cycle emissions. And so what we've tried to say is, well, maybe we don't need to have quite so many processing steps. Maybe we can exploit the features of what's already in the fuel structure. So things like the presence of oxygen and avoid having so much invested energy and have a useful fuel still. And this is what this shows. So going back to that idea of octane, what octane rating for a gasoline type fuel describes is how resistant a fuel is to knock. And knock is exactly what I was just talking about, this auto ignition process, but which in a spark ignition engine is completely undesirable. And so in the interest of time, I won't go through in great depth what we found, but what we tested in this particular example is a whole range of different molecules that come from that map that was on the previous slide, but which represent different, uh, different degrees of processing, have a different number of processing steps involved to see if applying that extra processing was really worth it in terms of increasing the knock resistance or the usefulness of the fuel to this extent. And it wasn't necessary. Some of the fuels, which were barely processed at all, the things like the fur fuel and alcohol, actually showed a very, very good, very high resistance to knock. And the fuels which had many, many, many stages of processing showed broadly equivalent resistance to knock. And there are reasons why you might not want to use that initial molecule, reasons to do with toxicity and, and handling. But from the combustion perspective and releasing energy, it's not necessarily perhaps to have invested all that energy to get to the more refined product. And here's another example of this. This is looking at pyrolysis. Pyrolysis is breaking down woody materials in the absence of oxygen, but at high temperatures. And as you break, as you use higher and higher temperatures, you tend to break down those molecules more and more and strip off things like branches. That's what I'm showing on the right-hand side of this slide here. As you go down in temperature, the kinds of potential fuel molecules that are produced from this pyrolysis process tend to have more bits sticking out. They tend to more closely resemble the biomass that they started out with. And so we did a whole series of experiments where we tried to investigate, find out what was the effect of perhaps doing this process at a lower temperature and leaving more of those branches present. And this is what we saw. Again, this is ignition delay on the y-axis. And then along the x-axis, there's more and more of those different potential pyrolysis molecules present in the fuel blend that was tested. And you can see as well, as you tend to go up in the duration of ignition delay, there were more and more of those methyl branches present. There were more bits of the original molecule left. And so again, we could identify that there's a cost, there's a trade-off between perhaps running your pyrolysis process at a higher temperature and then the potential performance of the fuel that's produced as well. Now, I said I was gonna mostly talk about liquid fuels and I have mostly talked about liquid fuels, but something that we're increasingly thinking about as well in terms of renewable fuels are not just fuels that are net zero carbon in that the kind of carbon that's, that's produced on burning them comes from, from a renewable source, we're also starting to think more and more about literal zero carbon fuels, things like hydrogen. And this is, this is another area in which we've worked. And this now, what I'm showing in these two figures is a pattern of heat release rate. So I said right at the beginning that one of the things we measure all the time inside the engine is in cylinder pressure. And what that allows us to do is see in real time, how quickly is the fuel burning? Well, when does it even start burning? And then how quickly does it start to release energy? Does it, how long does the burning process last? Because all of that is very important for understanding how efficiently that energy is transferred to useful workouts. And it also tells us about how pollutants are going to form. And so what we're looking at on these two slides is in the context of two very different size engines, when we start to take away the liquid fuel, the fossil diesel in this, in this uh, particular example, and we add instead hydrogen, how does that change that pattern of combustion phasing? And what you can see is, is a change in, in having sort of a very concentrated combustion in a, in a quite small area to having a much wider kind of zone of combustion, if you like, as more and more hydrogen is present. 
and that has advantages and disadvantages with regards to the emissions. And you can see that here on this slide as well, where we look at, just look at the two right-hand side figures, and we can see as we increase the amount of energy from hydrogen, actually we're also increasing in it and, and um, having an impact on the amount of NOx that's produced, especially in the smaller light duty engine. So on the one side, we're doing a positive thing. We're hopefully using a renewable source of hydrogen. We're offsetting the fossil diesel, but actually we're having this unintended impact then because of the change in the way in which energy is released on the NOx emissions as well. So this is nearly the very last thing I want to show you. So we talked about NOx emissions very quickly in terms of air quality. And then the other thing that's very important as well is to think about particulate matter, particles that get produced during the course of combustion. And the problem we have is that not all particles are the same. They vary massively in size and they can also vary massively in the impact on human health that they have, depending on what the other kinds of things are, the other chemical species that are present on the surface of those particles. And so what this figure shows very quickly is an experiment where we have a, a furnace, a ceramic tube furnace that goes up to 1300 degrees. And what we can see is that it is now, um, it's uh, because we, we, we try different fuels, sorry, in that furnace. And what's happening is we are starting to see an impact on the toxicity of the particulates that's produced. And we can see a change in temperature with, with toxicity, as well as a change in the fuel composition having an impact as well. Sorry, I think I'm nearly out of time, guys, and I apologize, I fluffed that slide a little bit because I'm rushing. So, very last thing is to think about where you are in the world and the kinds of sources of biofuels and other renewable feedstocks that might be available. So very quickly here, this is an example of two different types of biodiesel, one made from coffee grounds and one made from waste date, date pits. And, and both work reasonably well. But then if we think again about that whole life cycle and, and how you know that impacts on the sustainability of the fuel, you need to as well bear in mind local impacts on how abundant and how renewable those different feedstocks are because they both work. That was the point with this slide. So I'm sorry, guys, I've rushed a little bit, I think, for these last five minutes or so, but it's been a pleasure to, to share with you some of our research, some of our work here on developing renewable fuels. And um, yeah, I think this, so thank you again. I think there's some time for a few questions. And um, yeah, I think, yeah, definitely time for questions now. So I think I need to check the questions. Sorry, just a second, guys, while I get up the questions for us to look at. Okay, so. Um, okay, so I have had a question asking me to explain again, ignition delay. And yes, I can definitely, I'm sorry, guys, I was just showing you all the questions, wasn't I? Anyway. Ignition delay. So let me find a figure which will help to illustrate what I mean with ignition delay. Okay, so ignition delay. Like I said, what's really important if we want an efficient, clean release of energy is we want to control the time and, and the rate at which that energy is released. And so in a diesel engine, also known as a compression ignition engine, what happens is that at the beginning of the compression stroke, so at the start of the stroke in which the piston moves up from the bottom of its stroke to the top of its stroke, and it starts to compress, to reduce the volume of the air trapped inside the combustion chamber or trapped inside the cylinder. As it does that, as it reduces that volume to create a high temperature, high pressure environment, there is in fact no fuel presence. The fuel is only added, it's only injected into the combustion chamber very, very shortly before the piston reaches the end of that compression process and starts to move back down and hopefully have useful work done against it to produce energy out. So the fuel is only injected at very high pressures, as I think I said, just about, you know, just, just very, very soon before the end of that compression stroke. And, and what happens then is that that fuel does not start burning straight away 
the fuel, because it's quite stable at kind of standard conditions, is um, is uh, is uh, is very stable. It's not burning. We don't want it to burn when it's just kind of held at ambient conditions. And so it has a certain sort of reactivity associated with it, which means it's only when it finds itself in that high temperature, high pressure environment does it start to burn. But the rate, or sorry, even before it starts to burn, it needs to break down. It needs to vaporize. It needs to go from the liquid phase to the gas phase. And then individual chemical reactions, reactions with the oxygen present in the air that's trapped inside the combustion chamber also need to start happening. And for those reactions to start happening, ha is, it's very much affected by the initial structure of the fuel molecule. So, so the rate at which those reactions, those chemical reactions that then take place that lead up to the point at which ignition occurs, those are very much affected by how easily the fuel molecule can be taken apart, as it were, by the oxygen in the air. And if it's harder, if it requires more energy and more time to take the fuel molecule apart, then there's a longer duration of ignition delay than if it's a fuel molecule that very readily falls apart when it's attacked by oxygen molecules. And then you have a shorter duration of ignition delay. And that delay period is the time interval between the fuel first being injected into this high pressure, high temperature environment. And then it starts to burn this first useful release of heat energy. And that has, I didn't get a chance to go into it very much, but that has a big impact then on particularly things like NOx, nitrogen oxides, which are very much influenced by temperature. So, so hopefully that helps a little bit more uh, with regards to ignition delay. So I have another question here. I'll just read this out uh, for the benefit of everybody. So this is somebody saying that they were very interested and passionate uh, in biofuels, but they, they feel like they've kind of lost their faith in it because of the, the comparison, the developments uh, in electrical energy. And so what keeps me interested in biofuels? What makes me confident enough that it will at least compete with electrical energy? That's a really good question. And it's the kind of question that, you know, I, as, as somebody who's researching and working in biofuels, I have to constantly keep asking myself because I really want to be doing something useful, you know? Um, I really want to be trying to solve problems. As an engineer, I don't want to be doing something that's not going to have some kind of positive impact at the end of it. So why am I still excited about biofuels and not kind of wholly sold on, on everything going to electrical energy? Well, there are kind of practical uh, aspects. You know, there is, I think, the electrification of passenger cars, of, of light duty vehicles is really, really positive. It's a really good thing for, for air quality. And if, you know, in thinking about the UK in particular, if the kind of uptake of renewable energy and the kind of decommissioning of gas and coal can keep pace with that increased demand, then electrification is excellent. It's a really good solution towards greenhouse gas emission reduction and also improving urban air quality. I think it gets harder as you move away from those smaller kind of light duty vehicles towards kind of bigger, heavier vehicles, trucks, buses that need to have a very long range that effectively need to carry lots and lots of energy with them. And there are, there's, you know, there's so many other solutions, things like hydrogen fuel cells, for example, and the batteries are getting better all the time. But, but storing chemical energy in the form of a liquid and then releasing it during combustion or oxidation is really, is a really good way of achieving a high energy density and having a really efficient way of then releasing that energy as well. So I think that electrification absolutely is really positive and has a great role to play in improving our urban environments and, and making more and more use of, of renewable energy as that supplants all the fossil energy that's used in electrical power production. But there are going to be certain applications where actually it's still really helpful to have a very high energy density liquid biofuel type thing or another kind of renewable fuel things like so not just on the road for the heavy trucks but thinking about aviation that really needs to maintain that high energy density and it's very conservative that industry in terms of how readily it can switch to to any different form of propulsion things like shipping as well where there isn't the opportunity to, to charge up very regularly that kind of thing and and the other thing i find exciting about biofuels still and motivated still is this idea that we can take what is a problem perhaps 
So the production of waste biomass. So let's say you, you have a, a field of crops and after harvesting the fruit or whatever it is, the, the rest of the plants are just left, just left to, to, uh, left to kind of rot in the field. That, that can be positive, that can help with the whole ecosystem, the whole kind of replenishing and nutrients of things. But they may just rot, they may just rot and produce methane, CH4, which will then escape into the atmosphere. And, and to a certain extent, it's okay because it's renewable carbon, but, but it, it's not particularly good. And if we can collect that waste, and there are perhaps other, that's not perhaps such a good example, but maybe there are other things around municipal wastes, waste streams that have had some embodied energy put into them already, if we can, you know, rather than letting that energy go to waste, if we can then collect up that energy and use what is a problem, disposing of that waste to solve another problem, another challenge, which is providing a sustainable, entirely renewable liquid fuel for applications that demand it, then I still, I still find that really exciting. So hopefully, hopefully that helps. Uh, so we've got a few more questions. So I've been asked as well to explain what is knock resistance. So knock resistance, as I said, is very heavily linked to this idea of ignition delay. So in a diesel engine or a compression ignition engine, you need the fuel to auto ignite. We absolutely rely on the fuel auto igniting because there is no spark. There is no kind of external ignition source applied to make the fuel ignite otherwise. So it has to, it has to auto ignite. In a spark ignition engine, in order to choose the time at which energy starts to be released, rather than relying on the fuel to auto ignite, what's done instead is that a spark, an electrical spark, or some you know, electrical spark, let's say, is applied as the ignition source to get it to burn at a specific time to be optimized in terms of efficiency and in terms of emissions. And so, whereas for a diesel type fuel, it's very important that when it finds itself in that high temperature, high pressure environment, it does auto ignite. In the case of the gasoline type fuel for spark ignition combustion, because the ignition process is taken care of, you've already set in your engine management system the time at which you want the fuel to auto ignite. What you don't want is for the fuel to auto ignite beforehand or, to, or for parts of the fuel to auto ignite before the flame from that spark has reached them and they release energy at the right time. And when, when in a spark ignition, a fuel ignites and we don't want it to, that's termed knock. So knock resistance is the inverse of the ignition delay, if you like. Knock resistance is how well does a fuel resist auto ignition when it finds itself in that high pressure, high temperature environment. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, so there's another question now about how some countries want to reduce and stop support for carbon-based fuels. Which fuels other than ammonia or hydrogen do I think will be viable in around 2040 for transport applications, especially marine? Okay, yeah, I think that's a really good question, especially the marine uh, context. And you're right, hydrogen and ammonia are seeing so much, um, so much interest at the moment as being literal zero carbon fuels, because we can, in the same way that energy is released, when carbon is oxidized to CO2, water, hydrogen also releases energy in the same way. And ammonia is thought of as a hydrogen carrier. It's just a, a different, the, it's just a different way of getting hydrogen into sort of a combustion zone. But what else is gonna be important? Well, I still think that where we talk about zero carbon fuels, it's important for us to make a distinction between different types of carbon. So what's really important when we think about zero carbon fuels is that it's zero fossil carbon, because that's, it's that carbon which has been out of the, the kind of the carbon cycle for millions and millions of years. That's what's having this net effect, this net impact, increasing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And so I think it's still, you know, we can still think of in some ways biofuels that contain carbon because they're made of plants and organic matter, I think it's, it, I think they will still have a place because they, relative to hydrogen and ammonia, those liquid biofuels especially, can be very much, uh, very much easier to store and to handle, and especially in the marine context. In the marine context, you know, the kinds of engines that are used in big shipping vessels, 
they are they, they're huge they're huge they're very slow relative to what you might find in a in a vehicle on the road and that gives you lots of opportunity to have a fuel which is you know not as as optimized in terms of its physical properties as the kind of thing that's needed in a much smaller engine and so in fact that the fuels that are used at the moment in the marine sector are very very sort of crude they're literally what's left behind after the fuels for aviation and for road transport are taken away and so if going back to that idea of kind of taking what's a waste stream what's a problem on one hand and then fulfilling the need for some kind of renewable energy on the other hand i think in the marine sector there's going to be use of these kind of some of these these molecules these chemicals that come from biomass that come from waste streams without very much energy invested and that is that links a bit to the next question which is what is a fuel life cycle and so i i think what i was getting at when i was talking about a fuel life cycle it's for us to think not just about what kinds of emissions does the fuel produce when it is when it's burnt when it's used at point of use but to high, kind of include everything about how the fuel is made about how the feedstock the biomass for example how is that grown or produced and if fuels are to be truly sustainable, you need to account for the carbon emissions, for the air quality impacts, for the other ecological impacts that arise at each stage of that, of that process. And so when I, when I think about the fuel life cycle, I think that there's, there's always going to be a compromise between perhaps the impacts at one stage, say the end usage, and then the impacts that arise at the other stage. And as engineers, I think we need to be aware of that compromise and, and find a solution to it so that if we invest, let's say, less energy, less processing time upstream towards making the fuel, that's OK, perhaps, because we, we understand that and we can change the combustion process a bit to account for what could be, say, a longer ignition delay or, or a lesser knock resistance. So so hopefully that helps. Sorry, there's a few more questions, so I'm, I'm trying to, to race through them. So are there different ways of burning fuels? Yeah, absolutely. So I've shown you lots of examples today in the context of internal combustion engines. So these are these are piston engines where you you burn the fuel inside a very small volume and it happens in a cycle. There's a cycle you you draw in fresh air, which is the other reactant that you need for burning the fuel. You add the fuel, you create a high temperature, high pressure environment. The fuel burns, consuming the oxygen. And so then after expanding the volume and getting some useful workout, then you get you get useful energy out and you have to start the process again. Uh, but there are other ways of burning burning fuels. There are turbine processes, gas turbines, similar to jet engines, which are more of a continuous combustion type process where you're constantly adding in fuel, constantly drawing in fresh air, and they can be very efficient under certain applications as well. And I think we'll come into it in a second. There is, there's questions about pyrolysis, but there are there are ways as well about, uh, you know, and boilers. Or it depends really on the application and, and thinking about what kinds of, what would you want, what kind of energy do you want out at, at the end process? Do you want a mechanical workout, which is where something like an internal combustion engine is very useful? Or do you want heat? In which case, a, a you know a more type of a, a boiler type process might be very useful as well. Uh, so the next question is: When creating new renewable and innovative fuels, do you always try to look for similarities between the chemical structure of these and non-renewable fuels? That is a really good question. So what I think you're asking is: In trying to spot what might be a really good new fuel, do we do we kind of use our existing knowledge of what current fuels look like to help inform that and the question is i'm sorry the answer is yes and no because you can do that and then intuitively so let's say if we find certain chemicals molecules coming from a renewable source that look a lot like current fossil fuels then we you know it gives you a pretty good indication that they'll probably behave much the same way as well when you start to put them in an engine when you start to burn them and so that's that's quite a safe route to producing a renewable fuel by making it look like a current fuel, then it's more or less guaranteed to work. But, but going back to this idea of the fuel life cycle, there aren't many materials that 
that kind of come from nature that are renewable that resemble these fossil fuels because those fossil fuels were you know were held at high temperatures and high pressures for millions and millions of years it's a very specific very very long duration type of processing and so often you won't find renewable molecules that look like those current fuels and to make them look like those current fuels it goes back to this idea again of the fuel life cycle requires those many sequential stages of adding in for example hydrogen adding in temperature and breaking down and modifying the fuel so there's always an investment of energy so it can be helpful to have in mind what we know works well but actually we often try and look for fuels that don't look anything like current fuels and we look at for example whether or not we can make use of the extra functionality the extra reactivity of the presence of an oxygen atom within the fuel to try and circumvent the need to make the fuel look much more like a, a current fuel and thus avoid that kind of extra energy investment. So uh, the next question I have is, what is my opinion on pyrolysis plants to reduce plastic pollution? I think that's that's a really interesting uh, question again, because so pyrolysis is one of these thermal processes where you can take a solid material and break it down into a liquid or a gas with potential as a fuel. But if we think about using plastic as a feedstock for that process, it's tricky, isn't it? Because it might be a good way of kind of attaching value to the plastic waste and incentivizing the collection and then the utilization, the reuse of that plastic waste. And it makes, you know, it might make, uh, you know, converting that plastic waste to a fuel, therefore it might provide an incentive for keeping it out of the environment. It might kind of, it might make better use of the embodied energy within those plastics as well towards making a fuel. But, but the problem is at the moment, most of that plastic waste is plastics that are made from fossil fuels. So if you make a fuel out of that plastic waste, yes, it's a good thing to be using at the waste, but ultimately when you burn it, you're going to be releasing fossil derived carbon back into the atmosphere. And so there's, there's arguments for maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe you should try and you know contain that carbon still that's locked up in the plastics rather than intentionally releasing it. And so ho hopefully that, that helps a little bit. So how do I see methanol as an alternative future fuel for ships, especially since it can be used easily with, uh, with fuel cells, I think. And if it's a good option, how can we decrease the carbon emission while using methanol other than increasing efficiency? So methanol is, is an interesting uh, potential fuel. As you say, you can use it in fuel cells, you can burn it in an engine. And what's interesting about methanol is it's one of the molecules, the fuel molecules that can be more readily made by uh, what you might have heard being described as e-fuels, electric fuels, or power to liquid processes, PTL, power to liquid fuels. Fuels that take renewable electricity and then via a whole range of different processing steps, use that renewable electricity, often starting out by making hydrogen from electrolysis of water, and then perhaps some carbon that's captured from the atmosphere, they use that renewable electricity to make a liquid or a gaseous fuel. And methanol, because it's very simple, only contains one carbon atom, it's very small, is one of the easier fuels to make via that kind of process. But as a fuel, it's not necessarily uh, very attractive because it contains uh, a lot of oxygen, oh, sorry, a lot of oxygen for the amount of carbon, the amount of energy that's present. Um, and so it doesn't have a very good energy density. It has quite a low energy density compared to more complex molecules. And, and if it is a good option, how do we decrease the carbon emission while using methanol other than increasing efficiency? I think, so obviously if you increase efficiency of any process, and so we, for the energy that goes in, it may be chemical energy in the form of a fuel like methanol, we get more useful energy out, then obviously to do a certain amount of work, you don't have to invest so much energy, so much fuel energy in the first place. And that's that's one way, as you say, of reducing carbon emissions. But with, with the methanol, I think it comes back to, again, this idea of where is the carbon in the methanol coming from? And if it's a genuinely renewable methanol, most methanol at the moment is made from natural gas, and so it's not. But if it is a genuinely renewable methanol, then actually maybe we don't mind the carbon emissions that come associated with releasing energy from it, because we're putting back in then short-term carbon from biological sources back into the atmosphere. 
And so I'm conscious I'm probably not got too much more time, but there is another question here about hydrogen and diesel mixtures. So somebody asks, isn't it true that hydrogen diesel mixtures with a high amount of hydrogen can actually increase turbulence inside the combustion chamber and injection equipment and thus have a negative impact on the emissions? Yes, yes, adding in hydrogen. I'm sorry, I skipped for it very quickly, I think in the slides, but adding hydrogen is, uh, is yeah, is really, um, is really complicated in terms of the impact that it has on the combustion process. And primarily it's because you're going from, especially if we're talking about hydrogen diesel combustion, in, in just direct injected diesel combustion, you have combustion only taking place within quite a confined zone within the combustion chamber around the peripheries of the diesel sprays. And it happens at more or less stoichiometric conditions, which means you have the right amount of oxygen for the amount of fuel you're burning. If you start introducing hydrogen, because hydrogen is a gas, typically you will pre-mix that hydrogen so that you have a homogeneous mixture of hydrogen and air inside the combustion chamber. You don't have to, you can direct inject it, but you're changing then the nature of the combustion. And it's going from being very concentrated just around the liquid fuel sprays then to perhaps still having those liquid fuel sprays providing the pilots ignition, the starter combustion, but then you have a much greater zone in which, which the hydrogen is burning as well. And yeah, that can have an impact, as you say, on, on things like turbulence, it can have an impact on instant the temperatures, the distribution of temperatures, and also the spatial distribution of where things like nitrogen oxides can form. So it is possible to use hydrogen in that way, in a way that doesn't introduce emissions, but you need to have an understanding of what's happening to the combustion process when you do that displacement of the liquid fuel with the hydrogen. So thank you everybody for the questions. I've really enjoyed answering those questions and I'm really sorry, but I think we are pretty much out of time. But I really, as I said, really enjoyed all those questions and the opportunity to, uh, to share my research and what I think with, with so many of you. So thank you all for attending. So please though, do take advantage of the free uh, taster lectures in other subjects that are coming out uh, from UCL engineering as part of spring into STEM. Uh, I think there's some links in the chat now for you to access though. There's also, I'm afraid, a very, very short survey, which has got nothing to do with, with your applications or whatever you might be doing at the moment, but which is just about how you found this event. Uh, there's a link for that in the chat as well that we'd really appreciate you filling in if you have time. And yeah, everybody here, you should get an email subsequently as well with those links as well if you don't have a chance to click on them now. So thank you again for joining everybody. I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed talking, as I said, about some of our research on renewable fuels. So, uh, so take care and uh, yeah, hopefully maybe see some of you soon. Thanks, bye.